Let's bow our heads for prayer. As we're in the presence of the Lord tonight, you need to commit yourself to the Lord. That in the reading of the word, the preaching of the word, the Lord will minister to your soul and prepare you for what we have tonight ahead of us. In Jesus' name. Our Father, we thank you for the privilege of coming to your presence. Thank you for your love that so loved us and loved the world that you gave your only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but will have everlasting life. We thank you because the good news, glad tidings, the gospel of your love has reached us. And here we are tonight rejoicing in that love. Here we are tonight with the assurance of your peace in our hearts. We are praying, O Lord, as we come together tonight, the blood of the Lamb shed for the remission of the sins of all that believe will do an effectual work in every heart once again in Jesus' name. And we pray, O Lord, the bread of life that you are going to give to us now will strengthen us, will encourage us, will give us assurance, will lift up our eyes to see our beloved Redeemer once again on the cross of Calvary. Not only on the cross, we'll see him, he was buried for us. And then he rose again for our justification. And now he's seated on the right hand of majesty on high interceding and pleading for us we pray lord you grant everyone the faith to behold to receive to possess to enjoy all that you have for every one of us once again open our eyes of understanding that we may see and behold wondrous things out of your word in jesus name we pray we approach our passage tonight in Matthew chapter 9, verses 1 to 8. We're following through on the series, Christ's power over sin, over sickness, over disease, over infirmities, over everything that militates against the temporary and eternal joy of the children of God. And as we approach the passage tonight, we approach it from two angles. First angle, it's part of a series showing us the supremacy of Christ, the sovereignty of Christ, the power of Christ over everything. It gives us a view of his authority. But then we also approach the passage in preparation for the Lord's Supper, our fellowship around the cup and the bread, the symbols of the blood and the broken body of our Lord and Savior Redeemer, Jesus Christ. The Corinthians often took the Lord's Supper, but there is something we notice among them. They didn't discern the Lord's body, and so they remained weak and sickly. Instead of being healthy and strong, it's when we discern, we understand the value and the virtue in the blood and in the broken body of the Lord, represented by the fruit of the vine and the unleavened bread, that the blessings of his sacrifice, the cleansing, the healing, the health will be ours. As I've told you already, Matthew chapters 8 and 9, uh, it's uh, in the chapters where Jesus manifested divine power and divine authority to destroy all the works of the devil. Matthew records for us the healing of the leper. He records for us the healing of the paralytic who was under torment. He records for us the healing of the woman with a serious fever and the stealing the coming of the raging storm. And even reveals to us how Jesus cast out many devils, many demons. Now he's going to show us how he also has the power and the authority given from above 
to heal and also to forgive sins. Look at the passage. Matthew chapter 9, reading from verse 1. And he entered into a sheep. Matthew chapter 9. Entered into a sheep and passed over and came to a own city. And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. And behold, certain scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemeth. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? For whether it is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk, but that ye may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Then saith he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go unto thine house. And he arose and departed to his house. And when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such power unto men. As usual, we're going to divide the message into three parts. Number one, cleansing through his blood. Cleansing through his blood. Number two, kill through his broken body. Kill through his broken body. Number three, the communion, the cup and the bread. The communion, the cup and the bread. We look at number one. Number one, we have Matthew chapter 9 verses 1 to 6. Cleansing through his blood. You've seen the story already. You knew this before. You heard it before. The man was so sick, paralyzed, that he couldn't help himself. He became a burden to other people. And these four friends, these four companions, they took him up on a bed. And they wanted to approach the Lord Jesus Christ so they could bring him into the very presence of the Lord. And because they couldn't find a passage, the account in Mark tells us they went over the roof removed the tiles and then dropped him in front of the Lord Jesus and Jesus Christ seeing their faith he said to the sick of the palsy he said your sins are forgiven you this you find also in Luke Luke chapter 5 as well as Mark chapter 2 if you want more details about a ceiling but I just want to point out some things to you Jesus Christ went to the very root of his problem and the root of all the problems in the world sin before sin came in there was no sickness it was as a result of sin coming in that sickness disease demonic afflictions all came into our world but then jesus christ came that whosoever will believe in him will have remission or removal or forgiveness or pardon for sin guilt will be taken away condemnation will be taken away god has done what he needs to do but then we human beings we have a part to play and anywhere the lord will see what he saw at that time sins will be forgiven sins will be taken away it's what is called remission of sin or our redemption in ephesians chapter 1 ephesians chapter 1 verse 7 we're told about our redemption and we're told about how it comes through in whom we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace we have redemption and it is through his blood he shed his blood he gave his life so that we will be redeemed and it says it's the forgiveness of sins and it says it is because of the riches of his 
grace. He himself in Matthew chapter 26 made it very clear that we can be ransomed, we can be redeemed, we can be forgiven, we can have the salvation of the Lord. Matthew chapter 26 from verse 26 and as they were eating Jesus took bread he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to the disciples and said take it this is my body a representation a symbol of his body and he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying drink ye all of it Verse 28, very significant, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for remission, removal, cleansing of sins. And so Jesus Christ himself made it very clear that the blood he will shed for us on the cross of Calvary, the moment we put our trust, our faith in him, our sins will be taken away and that's the joy we have as children of god that we heard the gospel we responded to the gospel we came to the lord we confessed our sins as much as we remembered unto the lord we placed our faith on the lord jesus christ and because of that the sins are forgiven. There is no condemnation now. For those who are in Christ Jesus, who no longer walk after the flesh, but walk after the Spirit. Because the law of the Spirit of life has set us free, made us free from the law of sin and death. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, it says, But if we, we who have known the Lord, we who have heard the gospel, we who are partaking, of that same gospel that john announced if all of us we walk in the light as he is in the light we have fellowship one with another as we come to the lord's table you want to understand this is part of the body of christ and if you are going to discern if you are going to understand the body of christ very well as so well act to christ you add to the members of the body of Christ. It means really then you discern the Lord's body. You know that this is the bride of the bridegroom, the bride of the Lamb. And then it says, you are walking in the light. I see what in the light we are having fellowship one with another. Then look at this. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. There must be that total cleansing where there is no sin remaining. There is no stain of sin that you are conscious of. There is no shade of sin that you are excusing. There is nothing at all that is behind the curtain that you are hiding. By the grace of God, the blood of the Lamb has washed you and cleansed you. Come back to our story in Matthew chapter 9. In Matthew chapter 9, they brought this man to the Lord. And then he saw their faith. That's the one first thing, write that now. Faith. What's faith? Faith is forsaking all. I trust him. It's not your good works that you have done. It's not the tears that you shed. It's not the agony that you may go through. It's not the philanthropic activities or actions that you have manifested. For by the deeds of the law shall no man be justified in his sight. But forsaking all, I trust him. It is not what you do. It is what he has done. Because of what he has done. On the cross of Calvary, you put your faith in him. And that faith justifies you. Sins forgiven. Number one sin then, faith. That's what the Lord is still looking for today. Number two, forgiveness. He told the paralytic man, after seeing their faith, he said, Thy sins be forgiven thee. Would you please understand? All the sins he committed since he was born. Everything all bundled together. 
And Jesus took everything and he seemed to put it in the depths of the sea of God's forgetfulness, never to be remembered against him anymore. Thy sins are forgiven thee. Number one is faith. Number two is forgiveness. Number three, fault finding. There were some scribes there. There were some Pharisees there. And those scribes have not all died. Those scribes are still alive today. And they were questioning in their mind, Who is this that he forgives sin? What authority has he God that is able to forgive sin? And Jesus knew their thought. They didn't have the right thought. As we come to the Lord's table tonight, there's something you don't want to do. You do not want to stay in the position of those unqualified scribes judging Christ, judging the body of Christ, judging the people of God. You want to discern the Lord's body. You do not want to have any iota of fault finding in you. You come to the presence of God. You are cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. You are prepared so that you can partake of the symbol of the holy blood of Christ and the holy body of Christ. And a person like that, that wants to partake of such holy emblems, you will not be critical in your spirit. You will not be critical in your mind. You will not be opposing that and criticizing that. There will be no fault finding in you. Number four is favor. Divine favor. The man did not merit it at all. But when the Lord saw their faith, he gave him that forgiveness. And divine favor from on high came upon him and stayed with him he was to carry his bed and he was to go that's what the lord is telling us as we come together tonight it's not because we're qualified it is not because we merit anything it's by the favor of the lord unmerited favor of the lord just as i am i come to thee and you come to him like that because he is jesus christ the redeemer and the savior after he settled with them those fault finders and he told them i did that that you will know i have authority he said the messiah the christ the savior i have authority from heaven to forgive sin then he came to the healing the cure of the body that leads me to point number two cure through his broken body here we're told in verse five for whether is easier thy sin to say thy sins be forgiven thee or to say arise and walk that means he had the power he had the authority that he could make that man well how is that and why was that because it's been prophesied and this is according to the fulfillment of prophecy in isaiah chapter 53 Isaiah chapter 53 reading from verse 4 and verse 5 surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows yet we did esteem him stricken smitten of God and afflicted because but he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for iniquities the chastisement of our peace was upon him and everybody read the rest aloud with his stripes were healed there are many people that quickly jump to a the conclusion they say yes it says by stripes were healed but he's talking about that's what they say he's talking about inner healing it's talking about salvation it's another way they will say of talking about salvation let scripture interpret scripture. Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. From verse 16. When the evening was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed of devils. And he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick. That's not inner healing. That's real healing. That's physical healing of ailments that are tangible, felt, known in their bodies. After he healed them, 
the inspired writer then passes the comment in verse 17 that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet saying himself Christ himself took our infirmities and bear our sicknesses and he's still doing the same today that same Jesus that went about doing good healing all that were oppressed of the devil because God was with him is still going about today healing all that are oppressed of the devil and if you have any problem as we come together tonight and we partake of this emblem representing the pure holy righteous sinless flawless body of the lamb of jesus christ what he did in reality when he was here on earth he will do in your body in your life in jesus name have you noticed what we read there in that story in matthew chapter 9 number one the concern of companions there were some companions friends that were concerned about this man and they brought this man unto the lord and it's a wonderful thing we're grateful to god for friends who encourage our faith for friends who pray and believe with us when we could not help ourselves we could not pray alone we're grateful to god for friends that shield us from false finding scribes we're faithful to we are grateful to god for friends who will bring us to the presence of christ and keep us there in the presence of christ until we receive help from heaven number one the concern of companions number two the compa the compassion of christ christ saw him in his pitiable condition and he had compassion on him and that leads to number three the cure by christ he pronounced the word and it was a word of authority he told him rise up take up thy bed and instantaneously the power of the lord came on him took up his bed and he could walk as we come together tonight and we take the bread representing his broken body understanding that by his stripes we are healed that healing virtue coming from the lord will pass into your body in jesus name Point number three, the communion, the cup and the bread. Already you know that Jesus Christ himself instituted the Lord's Supper. And then we're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, reading from verse 23. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 from verse 23. This is a classic New Testament passage on the commemoration of the lord's supper briefly look at five things in this passage as you open up your heart and your mind for the holy spirit to interpret the word of god to you in preparation for this uh, holy ceremony of the lord's supper number one is the pattern of the lord's supper the pattern of the lord's supper verse 23 for i have received of the lord that which also i delivered unto you that the lord jesus the same night in which he was betrayed he took bread and when he had given thanks he break it and said take eat this is my body which is broken for you this do in remembrance of me verse 25 after the same manner also he took the cup when he had stopped saying this cup is the new testament the new covenant in my blood this do ye as oft as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me number one the pattern of the lord's supper it dates back to the night 
when Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, was betrayed. And you will see the pattern, you will see the order. First, the bread, then the cup, not the other way around. First, his body was broken and bruised for you and for me. Then his blood was shed for you and for me. First, he said, take eat this bread and after that drink this cup number two the purpose of the lord's supper as you look at verses 24 through to 26 you will see the purpose of the lord's supper and when he had given thanks he break it and said take eat this is my body which is broken for you this do in remembrance of me after the same manner also he took the cup when he had sought saying this cup is the new testament the new covenant in my blood this do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me for as often as ye eat this bread the bread first all the time and drink this cup the drinking second after follow after eating the bread we do show the lord's death till he come we're told then the purpose is to bring to remembrance is to recall is to call to mind what christ did for us when his body was torn and broken on our behalf his bones were not broken the stripes that tore his flesh were for our healing. The cup is a reminder of his shed blood, which washes away all our sins. As we prepare ourselves to partake of the Lord's Supper, we need to exercise implicit faith. It is in the full atonement for total healing because of the broken body and for total thorough cleansing because of the shed blood number three the proclamation of the lord's sacrifice the proclamation of the lord's sacrifice see it in verse 26 it tells us for as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup ye do show that's to proclaim that's to declare ye do proclaim ye do show ye do declare the death the lord's death we're then declaring we are proclaiming we're showing the lord's sacrifice what he did so that we can be saved every time we partake of the lord's supper we're in effect preaching a sermon we are proclaiming that christ died to make atonement for our sins a reality and that he died to save the world as many as will believe the lord's supper then is a, rem a reminder that we are to be evangelists and missionaries committed to telling the world of christ the savior who died to save sinners number four the prophecy of the lord's return the prophecy of the Lord's return. In that verse 26, he says, First often, as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death, then till he come. That means then the Lord's Supper begins by looking backward at the death of Christ. But it doesn't terminate there. It involves looking forward to the day when he will return. Our expectation is that he will come soon. And through the communion, we remind ourselves of the fact that he's coming again. And because he's coming again, we're preparing ourselves. And the Lord's Supper actually is just like a foretaste of the marriage supper of the lamb that we are going to partake of and if you are disqualified in taking the lord's supper today don't you know you would also be disqualified in taking having the marriage supper of the lamb number five 
our prepar preparation for the Lord's Supper. Our preparation for the Lord's Supper. In uh, verse 27, wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, it says, shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. It then behooves us, it's necessary that a faithful minister of the gospel will not fail to warn children of God, people of God, and the, uh, and the people who profess to know the Lord, that we do not just rush into the presence of the Lord in taking the Lord's Supper. We must be people that know things that are important. The bread we are taking is not like ordinary bread that we eat. And the cup we are drinking is not like the ordinary fruit of the vine we drink ordinarily. This is special and sacred because it is representing the body of Christ and the blood of the Lamb. And because it is special and sacred, you will have that sacred, sacred, uh, you have that sacred attitude. You have that serious attitude. You come to the presence of the Lord and you know that sin will make you unworthy. Internal sin, outward sin, unconfessed, unrepented of. The sin that is still there, you, have not, you are not free from. And it is not just what I call sin. And it is not just what your neighbor calls sin. What the Holy Spirit himself calls sin. That he convicts you about. That you feel condemned about. This is not a time to sweep any sin under the carpet. And with a guilty conscience and with a seared conscience and with an hardened conscience say it doesn't matter i will go and eat it anyhow you can't do that if you love yourself and the solution is not to say all right i will not take the lord's supper so that i don't get into trouble well if you are in sin even if you don't take the lord's supper are you not in trouble already because the trumpet can sound at any time and if the trumpet sounds and you are not ready for the coming of the lord there is sin that has spoiled and stained your life when you know that is coming back for a glorious church without spot without wrinkle without blemish or any such thing what should we do then especially knowing that the commemoration of the Lord's Supper is done in anticipation of the return of the Lord. What if he comes? That's the reason you will check up yourself. You will examine yourself. We're told in verse 28, But let a man examine himself. Joseph will not examine Mary. And Stephen will not examine Elizabeth. But Joseph will examine himself. Samson will examine himself. Mary will examine herself. Elizabeth will examine herself. Let each one examine himself. Isn't this the serious thing? And if we're a Bible-believing church, shouldn't we understand that this is the black and white clear teaching of the scripture and then like adult believers the people that know the wherewithal of doing what they are doing you come seriously to the presence of the lord and while we're preparing to take that lord's supper you're examining your heart you're examining your attitude you're examining your very life you're examining your interaction with the brethren you are examining the actions of your hand. The things you have been doing. You are examining whether you are right with God or you are not right with God. And so, let him eat that bread and drink that cup. Do you see the pattern is clear every time? Always the bread first. And then the cup, the, the, the fruit of the vine second. For he that eateth 
and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. What does that mean? You know, at that time that Paul the Apostle was writing, Christ has already died, and Christ had already gone to heaven, and the body, the literal body of Christ, was not here on earth, but the body of Christ, the members of his body, because we are the members of his body. The Corinthians, they had a lot of division. They had a lot of discord. They were knocking heads together. There was no unity among them. They did not discern the Lord's body. I am of Paul. I am of Apollos. I am of Severs. I am of Christ. They were dividing the body of Christ. Are there not people there that are sowing seeds of discord and the unity that sanctification brings going the same direction, saying the same thing, teaching the same thing, standing on the same truth, exalting the same Christ, discerning the Lord's body, keeping the Lord's body intact, not wounding the Lord's body over again it says many of them those corinthians they didn't discern the lord's body and when they saw another brother they didn't know that's a part that's a member of the body of christ and that anything we do to him we're doing to christ and paul paul must have got a sense of that and it was a burning sensation he had when jesus said saul saul why persecutest thou Tell me out loud. Me. He didn't see Christ. He didn't touch Christ. He didn't betray Christ. He wasn't one of the people that laid the lashes on Christ. He was persecuting Christians. Members of the body of Christ. He didn't discern the Lord's body. He was an unbeliever, an injurious man. And then Jesus said, you touch them, you are touching me. You persecute them, you are persecuting me. Why are you doing that? He said, he said, it's a hard thing for you to kick against the priest. And then he surrendered and he said, Lord, what will you have me to do? Isn't that all that it requires? Whatever you've done in the past, you come to the Lord tonight to raise up your two hands to say, I'm sorry. I didn't know it was you. If I knew it was you, I would respect you and honor you and humble myself and prostrate before you and lie in the dust he said no i'm not there but my body is there you want to lie in the dust and prostrate before me my body is there prostrate before them you want to honor me honor them you want to exalt christ exalt them any respect you want to do to christ the body is there discern the lord's body and if you have been making segregations and you have been making distinctions i like that one i dislike that one do you have any right to dislike a member of the body of Christ? Maybe that member of the body of Christ is the nose of Christ. Maybe he's the toe of Christ. Maybe he's the ear of Christ. Maybe he's the lips of Christ. Maybe he's the finger of Christ. Can you say, I hate, I dislike the nose of Jesus Christ? Can you call the nose of Jesus, the finger of Jesus, any part of Jesus ugly? That's what you are doing when you despise a member of the body of Christ. They are illiterates, maybe. They are semi-illiterates, maybe. They know nothing, maybe. They do not have what you have, maybe. Discern the Lord's body so that as we come to the Lord's table tonight, you will not drink, you will not eat unworthily for this cause. In verse, in verse 30, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep, many die. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But if we are judged, we are chastised of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. The Lord is telling us that we need to make a preparation. A preparation for the Lord's Supper tonight. And I pray that as you look up to Calvary tonight, and then you place your faith in Christ, in the body of Christ broken for you, in the blood of Christ that is shed for you, I pray that you will have the blessing of the Lord's Supper we are taking tonight in Jesus' name. You rise up now. As you rise up, take uh, your program. Wounded for me, wounded for me. There on the cross, 
he was wounded for me, gone my transgressions, and now I'm free. All because Jesus was wounded for me, risen for me, risen for me up from the grave. He has risen for me. Now, evermore from death, sting, I am free. All because Jesus has risen for me, living for me, living for me. There on the throne, he is living for me. Sit. To the uttermost now I shall be. All because Jesus is living for me and is coming for me. Is he coming for you? And we're looking up. Because the Lord is coming. It's coming for me. It's coming for you. One day to earth he is coming for me. Then with what joy is their face I shall see. Will you see him? Oh, how I praise him because he's becoming for me. You rise up now. As you rise up, close your eyes and pray. He's been wounded for you. And he has risen for you. And he's coming for you. And he's living for you.